stories. But I want you to be thinking about something as, as we share stories. Because we're sharing our, how we came to Christ and how we came to, to this church. Because this is important. Because we did a series last year about building the, the local church. And, and uh, God is the one who orchestrates. And he, the steps of a righteous man are ordered to the Lord. And you're not here by accident. You have a story, too, on how you got here. And uh, the, the work that l the Lord has done in your life to lead you to where you are today. And that's important because God is building something solid. I don't think that he builds a church for it to divide and split. And I think he call builds a church for it to flourish. Amen. So uh, you consider your story as we share our story. And Brother Terry is the newest member of our staff. And... Uh, we're so glad that God added him to us, and he is coming today to share his story. Thank you, Pastor. If you don't mind, I'm on the set today, which, according to Matt Terrell, is a perfect thing for me to do because sometimes I'm hard to chase around. So the reason I, I just wanted to sit and be comfortable today because I really... I'm not up here to preach a message or nothing. I just wanted to, to share my story of how I got here. You know, Jesus talks in the Gospel of John that uh, all those that enter, enter through the gate. He made himself clear that he was the gate. And he said, if you enter any other way, you're a thief or a robber. He says that when the, the hired hand, when the trouble comes, he runs and he scatters because he is not coming through the gate. So my, my journey to get me here has been by the hand of Jesus Christ. And I entered this church through the gate of Jesus Christ, and I'm uh, just so thankful for that. Um, before we get going too much further, I want to remind everybody that we are going to be having a men's Bible study up here. It's going to be moved from next Saturday, which is the 14th. It's going to be moved to the 21st. It's going to be here up here at 8 o'clock. It's a breakfast, and Trenton Barnes is going to be leading us in the first Bible study. And if you know Trenton, he's, a, he's definitely a young man who loves the Lord and loves the Word of God. So we encourage everybody to to be part of that. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Terry Randall. I'm 51 years old and I've been at this church uh, six and a half years this month. I'll be here seven years in August and um, I'm, I'm going to tell you, Mr. Jack prayed with me before I got up here, so I'm probably going to need some tissues, but you know, sometimes it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's the hand of God that that somebody would put their hand on your shoulder and pray for the exact thing that you need before you get up here. And today, that's courage. Because as I've been putting my story together, although my story is full of grace and mercy, and um, I sit here as a trophy of that grace and mercy, um, it came at a cost. It came at a cost to um, many relationships. It came at a cost of people's physical lives. And uh, it's taken a toll on so many people I've loved in my life, but... I'm not here today to revel in that. I'm here to tell you how God has consistently tried to reveal himself to me throughout my life. So I grew up, I grew up, uh, I didn't know my biological dad. I grew up um, in, a, in, a, in a good home. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot. It was not a godly home. I didn't know nothing about church. I didn't know nothing about Jesus. I didn't know nothing about God. I um, learned uh, very few things from my father. Uh, one of which is how to um, not control your anger and control every situation by releasing your anger and being the loudest and most physical person could usually stop any situation. So I picked up that characteristic of my dad, and I carried on with that for most all of my life until about four years ago when God um, healed me of that and removed that character defect from me through the work I do here at the church, through our recovery program and the people he's put in my life and my amazing wife has stood by my side as she watched God remove this anger and, and this, um, this fear of confrontation out for me. But um, we lived in Wynn until I was about 14 years old. If you don't know anything about Wynn, I actually did not live in the city of Wynn. I lived in a city called Fair Oaks. And Fair Oaks is uh, just a bunch of farms and fields. And, and there wasn't nothing really to do a whole lot except for um, 
mischief. I mean, any, anytime you could find something to just um, get yourself in trouble, it seemed like it was a good day, so I spent a lot of time doing that. I always had a knack for getting myself in trouble. I was uh, brought up to be respectful of elders and everything, so I was kind of like the Eddie Haskell of the Beavers. I was very respectful. Parents loved me and stuff, um, but they never knew that more often than not, it was me that um, led us into whatever mischief we were going to be getting into. But by the time I was 14 years old, we left Wynn and moved to Mountain Home. And um, this is where my life changed forever. Although at that time, I had drank alcohol before and, and smoked marijuana. Um, it was here where I was introduced to a whole new lifestyle of a high school that was just flowing with drugs and alcohol. And um, it, was, it, was the, it was the thing to do when I was in school was to, uh, to drink and, and, and uh, begin taking pills and stuff and just experiment with about anything I could. And uh, as I turned 18 years old, I began watching most everybody around me was starting to settle down. They were, they were getting married and, and having families, and they were, they were giving up that, 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 that lifestyle, the, the drinking and the partying and stuff. And um, although I wouldn't marry at the time I was 18 and had my first child at 19, I was never one of those fortunate enough to start tapering off of that because, see, that even though it might be the thing that kids do nowadays, um, it doesn't always mean that you'll outgrow it because Satan comes that he would kill, steal, and destroy. So more often than not, it's not just a phase. It's something that turns into a lifestyle, and something that turns into um, just death in itself. So as I began my first few years of marriage, I um, again noticed myself increasing in my drug usage, um, started causing problems in my marriage. Um, I was trying to live two different lives of, 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 of married husband and father and, and, and teetering on the, on the boundaries and, and the borderline of a, a full-blown addict and stuff. And as I had them two pulling me, keeping me always from falling all the way over to the full-blown lifestyle of an addict. Um, by the time I was 23 years old, I would, um, I would have a car crash that would, that would change my life. I mean, drastically change my life. I had uh, fell asleep at the wheel. It seems like the human body can only stay up so long without sleep. And about six days, it starts doing what it wants to do. And although my agenda was to drive myself to work, the, my body decided it would take a nap. And I came to and noticed that I was in halfway into a ditch, and I jerked the car steering wheel around, and I overcorrected and turned it sideways as a lady come out of a curve and hit me. It was a little Dodge Omni, and she would pin me against a tree where she would push all the way through the car, hitting me, uh, fracturing both of my hips, collapsing my lung, tearing my trachea, um, just... Riddling my body in cuts and bruises. And it would take them over five hours to cut me out of this car. And um, it would be the first time I was introduced to morphine. And it would open up a whole new um, gate into the lifestyle of an addict for me, which I would come back to revisit in the final few days I spent in that life before God called me to ministry. And um, I would love to say, I'd love to say that car crash really just opened my eyes and changed me, but it did not. But it did create a peculiar opportunity for me that I, I, I've never forgotten. And as I've been putting this story together and over the last few months just talking my, with my wife about my, my journey here, it's been coming on my heart more and more. See, I was, um, I was, I'd been friends. I was not really friends with him anymore because he had gotten really weird into this God and Jesus stuff. But I knew a man named Donnie Hart that I worked with for several years. And, and this guy was just an outlaw, man. I mean, gunfights. He was just riddled in gunshot wounds. And man, he was the guy I looked up to. He's just, um, I mean, he would fight over anything. And he was just a mean and nasty guy. Well, for the last couple of years before this accident I had, uh, he had quit all that. And he had got all religious and and he was always hounding me about changing my life and and going to church with them and he had became a youth leader and he was man he was just doing all this fruity weird stuff and always talked about God and at work he was actually working he wasn't stealing from the company and wasn't clocking in and going back out to the car and smoking pot and 
I was like, that dude, I don't know what happened to him, but I don't want none of that. So, but we had had a second car that my wife had drove, and we were making payments. He had started a body shop, and his thing was he would help people get vehicles. And um, he bought wrecked cars and refurbished them and fixed them up, and he would help low income or people of poverty have vehicles, donating them sometimes and stuff. So um, I had managed to be able to get a car through him for, for my wife to drive and everything. Well, I spent about, I spent six weeks in intensive care over this accident, but I spent about three months in the hospital. So I'd gotten home, and I was on a walker, and I was pretty much bedridden. Um, unless I had help getting up, I could get up on a walker for very small periods of time throughout the day. I was allowed to stand 30 minutes a day on it and everything. So I, I was there one day, and... Um, that just, it just came on my heart that I needed to call him and talk to him about this car. I didn't know when I was ever going to be able to make another payment and this and that. So I call him and, uh, started, I got this big old story I rehearsed and he stopped me mid story and he goes, Hey, listen, are you at home right now? And I go, yeah. He goes, Hey, listen, I would like to come by and visit with you for a little bit. I'm like, okay. Oh, uh, well, yeah. All right. So, you know, I get off the phone. I was like, Oh gosh, there, here we go. You know what I'm saying? Sure enough, he knocks on the door, and I tell him to come on in. He comes in. He's got a friend with him. And, um, man, he didn't let me get a word out. He came in on a mission and with a purpose. And uh, he said, Terry, listen, I have the title to that car right here in my hand. And if you'll let me and my friend pray with you right now, I will leave you this title, and you'll never owe me another dime on this car again. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> for sure. And I remember how I was sitting in a burgundy recliner. I remember where I was sitting along the window. I mean, I, 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 I just, my mind was outside the window and stuff. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you. I remember almost word for word this prayer. As he prayed down, he, he knelt down and put his hand on me. His buddy bowed down and put his hand on my back, and they began praying. And he thanked God for sparing my life, and he thanked God for bringing me to a point in my life. And he prayed that today would be the day that I received the free gift of salvation. And as he continued praying his prayer, he said, Amen. He got up. I didn't say a word. He set the title down on the end table, and he walked out. And it would be many years before I hear from him again, but I just couldn't believe that. So as life goes on, obviously it did not change my life. But over the next nine, ten years, I would, um, I would give myself more and more to the lifestyle of an addict, um, reaching a point of about 14 years of marriage where I would make a decision one day that I would um, give up the part that was keeping me from being the full-blown addict and living that full-blown lifestyle, and I would surrender that marriage and that daughter, and I would walk away from them, and I would never turn back to look for them again, and I gave myself fully to the lifestyle of an addict. And I'm going to tell you, over the next few years, I spent more time in jail, more time in hospitals. I spent more time destroying my life and those around me than a person could ever imagine. I shared earlier, I could sit up here for all day long and tell you the lifestyle that I lived in. But the one, two things that stood out of me of that lifestyle was the moments that God always try to reveal himself to me. I would be about 32 years old, and one of my closest friends would need me one night, and I would not uh, be there for him. I would turn my back on him, and he would make a decision that night that would cost him his life, his physical life. I don't mean metaphorically, but he is no longer with us. Mike Gilbert, one of the greatest men I ever met in my life. I grew up with him, watched his boys be grown up, and close friends with his wife, and uh, just thought the world of him. But he was living a life that was contradictory to the lifestyle of the act I was living and stuff. And although he always took me for who I was, it's just, it was always guilt and shame when I was around him. And that night, I did not want to be around him. So I'd choose to turn my back on him. And uh, that would be something that would uh, stay with me that I would never be able to, that I would never be able to run from that my whole life. And uh, no matter how many drugs I did or how much alcohol or how many women, I would end up um, dating and or marrying, as though I would go on to marry a couple more times. One of them uh, being the, the one that lasts forever, being with the woman I'm married to now. But in that time, you know, I found out that, that, that I just thought that that's who I was meant to be. The, the lifestyle I lived was like none other, and uh, most people did not live through the lifestyle I lived through. So 
I just had came to believe that that's who God had made me to be. Why else would I be able to live through gunfights and knife fights and car crashes and overdoses and all these things that I was watching people better than me die from. So I just settled into that lifestyle thinking that that was the way it was going to be. And after this thing with Mike, about a year after that, I just, um, I, just couldn't, I just couldn't bury it. So I decided I would go and I would get help. So um, I found a place in Little Rock called Serenity Park. And I would check myself into there. It's a 12-step program. And um, it would be the second time that I can recall that God would, um, as I like to say, I came face to face with him and, and was given an opportunity to change my life then. See, the times leading up to that, I'd taken on a job traveling, and I became a lineman, and I was doing uh, cable construction, fiber optics, and I was climbing poles, and uh, I was able to be gone all throughout Arkansas and the states around Arkansas, and I uh, didn't care about a daughter who was home in a broken house and, and everything, so I had no responsibilities, I had no cares, so I, that just fit right into the lifestyle of the attic that I was living and I would come across many people during that time and meet many people. And again, I would meet a guy. And I was mistaken the other day. I was trying to come up with his last name. Uh, I do remember his first name was David. But David was a little bit different than everybody else. He, uh, he, he was a lineman. And uh, he was a cable dog. And if you know anything about the business, I mean, that's just pretty much a name for a um, total drunkard <laughs> that lived the lifestyle of just being gone and, and giving in to the bar scene and the drug scene and everything. But he was different than everybody else. He was always trying to get me to go to these AA meetings and these NA meetings, and he was always carrying a Bible around with them, and he was always trying to tell me about God, and he just really creeped me out any time I was around him and stuff. And I'm telling you, when you're high, there's something unnerving about a, a loving person that's just trying to tell the truth to you. And I'm telling you, it's a place I didn't like to be. It gave me the heebie-jeebies and stuff. So I would do the best I could to stay away from him. But every time I turned around, um, there he was. I was uh, worked my way up to I was one of the lead foremans out there. I was not only over the in-house crews, but I would oversee all the contractors that, that we used on these jobs and everything. And he was one of the top contractors because he was, now I know because he was a godly man and God was blessing what he was doing, just like with my friend Donnie and everything. So, um, but he just gave me the heebie jeebies and I didn't want to be around him. So I had finally burnt the last bridge by ending up in another county jail for the company I worked for. And although he did, the owner did come and bail me out, they let me know that they would no longer be taking me uh, to the next town as we began the next job, that I was too much of a risk. And, um, I totally understood that. Even though I was uh, the person I was, I understood that I was a risk. I mean, things was going to happen when I was around. Uh, people were either going to get hurt, stolen from, or it's going to cost you a lot of money. So um, I um, had a lot of respect for Mr. Johnny and stuff, and they would leave there, and I would be given an opportunity to go with this David guy. And he, uh, he would call me. He's like, man, I, 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 I want you. I have a job for you. I have a position I, 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 could, I could use you. And, I, man, I just wasn't having none of this, this, this Jesus stuff, you know what I'm saying? So I respectfully declined, and I would find myself homeless, many times eating out of trash cans, roadkill. I would found an old um, abandoned trailer in some woods and was managed to stay there for a few months before finally getting myself together to be able to get a hold of some family to get me back on back to where I belong on my feet and stuff. So as I entered into this rehab program, I uh, was pulled up to be dropped off that day, and there is a sign that said in a crossway, and one sign pointed to the Pulaski County Jail that said locked up, and the other one pointed across the street to a cemetery that said covered up, and one pointed to this place and said sobered up. So their motto was make the right choice. Hey, Many of y'all know we've ended now at this time our Believers Who Care program, but you know we for the longest, uh, about two years, we were part of the Believers Who Care program, and uh, one of my tasks was to go down once a month to city serve to, um, to pick up whatever we were getting for the donations for the people that were in need, and uh, it is immediately behind this rehab, that, that police department on the street behind there. So once a month for two years, I was able to drive by that rehab, in between that cemetery 
and that rehab and take a left there and go back there to city serve and be reminded of how much God has loved me, not just when I became a believer, but my whole life. See, my whole life, I feel like God wanted me. Not just, not just when I became churchy or religious or thought I was somewhat good, but my whole life he wanted my heart, as Pastor was saying. So as I entered that program, I gave it everything I had. I desperately wanted my life to change. What had happened between Mike and I was tearing me alive, and I did not want to be that person again. So from the minute I woke up at this rehab, which was for 30 days, I gave it everything. I would, I would be early for morning devotionals. I, hey, I, 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 would, I began working the 12 steps with the higher power being that of your choice. And listen, I would even get to a point where I would see people struggling that were weaker at me at, at this sobriety thing. I would take over their chores, allowing them to go early to meditation time, early to these step programs and stuff. And I gave it everything I had. And we were in a closed meeting one day, and the founder, they called him Joe C., of this rehab, um, came in. He was celebrating his 45th year of sobriety. And he was in a wheelchair. And he had came in, and he was going to teach that closed class today. Now, Mr. Joe loved to smoke cigars. And nobody was allowed onto this property beyond the, the, the doors of where we were at. Everything there was, was about anonymity. Nobody was allowed in here. And that door knocked and opened. And a man walked in and walked past me. And he walked up to Mr. Joe and he gave him a card and a cigar. And as he turned around to get ready to walk out the door, he made direct eye contact with me. And it was this man, David. And he come over and he knelt down beside me and he put his hand on the leg. He says, this is where I found God. This is where my life has changed. Listen to these people. They know the answer. And that was about my second to last day there. He would leave. I would never see this man again. I'm 51. This is when I was about 34, 35, and I would never see or hear from him again. And I, I prayed if this is being watched by any of those people that um, I, I just want to thank them. I just want to thank them. You know, I mean, as I sit where I'm at today, knowing the power of sharing the love of God, I just want to thank him for trying to share the love of God with me. And in, and in that, planting seeds in me that, um, golly, although I, I, I was just flooded with guilt and shame as I thought about my journey here, that I think of these moments in my life, and it just, it washes all that away, the love of God. So I would um, sit with my counselor the last day of this program, and I would be thrown into a whirlwind. As he sits down, the first thing he says to me, he says, now I want you to know you're not cured. You're an addict. You'll always be an addict. It's a disease. And what we've done is simply taught you the tools of how to pick yourself back up and start over again. Now, that decision to use those tools and to pick yourself back up will be on you. So I managed to, to make it about six months. I got out. I was living in a little town called Jailville. Found a church and uh, started going to church there on Sundays and uh, met a couple of guys there that, um, that really, I mean, really wanted to pour into me and, and, and show me the way and, and disciple me and everything. But I never, as Angela and I was talking about this, I never got the Jesus part. I knew God is a higher power, but I did not know the way to him was through Jesus Christ. And so um, within six months, I would be drinking again. And um, getting high again. And within a month of that, I would walk out on my second marriage. And I would never turn back for another shot at ever trying to, to be rehabilitated. See, I, I'd given many opportunities to family members that wanted me to get help and wanted to help me. But I didn't know what else there was for me to do. I'd gone to a program. I'd learned the 12 steps. I'd learned about God. Again, I'd had just myself convinced that this is who I was designed to be. Why else would I be able to be where I'm at? This is the way. All I have to do is learn how to maintain that part of my lifestyle so that I can function as an employee and a husband and a father and stuff. And I, I just thought if I could just balance maybe not so hard on the heavy drugs or the Xanaxes or this, but if I, could just, if I could just stay away from that stuff or those people that um, I could maintain like everybody else does. But I, there was never a balance. See, there's never a balance between light and darkness. 
See, it's either light or darkness. And you can't find yourself wanting to be a little bit in both of them. You have to find yourself completely, completely in the light. So as I would end up in uh, Baxter County Jail again, I would be in there for, I'd be on my 22nd day. I would be sitting there as a felon holding five new felony charges and 13 new misdemeanor charges. And I'd burnt every bridge and everybody in my life. And I was not getting bailed out. And I was fixing to start a long road to prison. And I became very comfortable with that. See, I also found that I was very comfortable in jail at this time in my life. I'd fit in very well with the lifestyle, the people there. I, uh, let's, let's say I even kind of excelled uh, in captivity because, again, I had learned from probably one of the masters of anger of how to, um, how to defend myself. So as I prepared myself for a long road of prison, I would receive a visit one day that would change my life forever. Another opportunity God had given me to come face to face with him and to make a decision. Uh, my mom had came to see me and she said that my friend Cindy wanted to come to see me. And my friend Cindy was the wife of Mike Gilbert and the mother of his two boys. And she had came that day and she had brought a brochure for a place called John 316 Ministries. And uh, she began telling me how her youngest son was there. See, he never handled the loss of his father very well. And he, um, having no male figure in his life, no relationship with Jesus, he himself turned to the lifestyle of the attic. And she had gotten him in there, and he was doing well. Well, it was a no-brainer. I was going to go. I wasn't going to get out of jail, but uh, many of you know, I believe uh, audibly God spoke to me that day in a very crowded visiting room, and um, I was not going to tell him no. So I made a decision to go. I would go for my first interview, and I would end up sitting next to Adam, which would be Cindy's son and Mike's youngest boy. And God would move on my heart there, and he would reveal to himself, to me, himself as the healer of everything. And he just told me that I was not here to be free of drugs and alcohol, that I was here to be healed. And he would begin doing that by healing me of the hurt and the pain and the shame of costing a young man the life of his father. And if I was willing to become obedient to him, that he would work in my life and he would change many things in my life. And uh, I accepted that that day. I did not get in. They told me to come back the next Sunday and try again, but that, that, that did not change. That did not change the decision I had made. And I would come back and get in that following Sunday. And that Monday night, I would surrender my life on August 2015 at the right-hand side of the altar at John 3:16 Ministries as Mitch Bell gave a message on Ephesians 2:8. for it is by grace you, you have been saved. It is a gift of God. And when he spoke the words, not of yourself, the Holy Spirit said to me, how many times have you tried to do this on your own? And I surrendered my life that night. And I began to allow God to work inside of me in that ministry and... I'm going to tell you, he started revealing himself to me more and more and more. I was there about two weeks, and I was permitted to go off campus. I went to uh, Mr. Bob Tuggle, had a, uh, a pawn shop burned down here, and we were rebuilding that, and we were out there one day. And if you know anything about John 316 Ministries, they're all about manual labor. And even though I was 45 years old, they thought I was designed to swing a pickaxe. So I was swinging a pickaxe into pretty much concrete because that's what you do when you're there is you work. So um, I was there. It was end of August. It was blistering hot. And a man pulls up and brings everybody there some Gatorades and introduces himself as Jason Ramsey. And I said, well, Mr. Ramsey, how's the world treating you today? And he said, the world treats me like crap, but Jesus Christ treats me good. And he jumped in his truck. <laughs> go ahead. Let's go ahead. And he left there. But little did I know that I would graduate that program in that January. During that time, I'd met an amazing woman. We'd begin dating. And when I say dating, that means we sit together on Sunday morning services. We wrote letters, and we were allowed to make one phone call for the longest time in the evening times. And then after proving a little uh, liability, I was made, allowed to use it also in the morning before service. So I would call her and Hey, listen, we were sitting in church one day, and I reached over, and 
just, just the way she looked at me, I knew. Now, I'm not just talking about how smoking hot she is. I'm just talking about, <laughs> listen, her love for the Lord and her, listen, her willingness to be on board of what God had called me to do. And I knew God had called me to the ministry of setting people free and preaching the word of God. And I touched her leg with my finger, my pinky finger, and I said, I'm going to sit in church one day, and I'm going to hold your hand, and we're going to be married, and we're going to serve the Lord together. And then, hey, six years, we're, we're serving the Lord. I love my wife, I'm going to tell you. But I graduated that January, and um, about March, I just, we were talking about well, I would be able to date after six months, and, and they were talking about me just go ahead and committing to a lifelong commitment to this ministry, and uh, I was coming back from out home one night with my buddy CJ, and this is the beginning of March or so, and I just started telling him, I'm like, I just don't feel that I'm called to be locked into here. I, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I just feel like God is, is, is calling me from here. Well, they would come that March, toward the end of March, uh, for the first Man Up conference, and um, again, I would meet a man named Jason Ramsey, although I did not personally meet him that day. I just heard him speak from the stage. But the decision was made that evening based on a message that a man named David Ensel came and preached it, man up. And he preached a message out of the book of Ruth, a message over blind obedience, about not knowing why God's doing the things he's doing, not having to know the whys and the hows, it's just about being obedient to God. And I went to my room, and I surrendered to God that wherever he called me, I would go. I would not question it. Even though I did not know the plans he had for me, I knew that his plans were the best. So, six months is coming up. Things just aren't working out. I'm not going to be allowed to date. I'm not going to be allowed this, that. And God constantly, constantly allowed me to be buffered with the plans that I had. Now, a lot of people will tell you that I left that ministry because I could not date my wife. Although that's good enough. <laughs> I, I would have eventually left <laughs> if they were not going to let me date this woman, okay? We knew. We had a plan. We had a God plan. But listen, I left that ministry because of blind obedience. See, as I settled that, I had a crew of guys out one day, and I was at Home Depot, and I walked past an aisle, and somebody says, hey, you're Terry Randall. And I turned around and said, hey, you're Jason Ramsey. <laughs> he says, I am, and I have a place for you in my transition house, and you can start work for me Monday. I'm like, oh, okay. He goes, no, you can start work for me Monday. So after leaving that weekend, that's what I did. I started working for Jason, and I moved into his transition house. And I didn't know what in the world God was going to have me to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I had a desire to preach, and I found a new desire, a new calling on my life to help and esteem others and to strengthen other people. So my first Friday night up here, Jason had been telling me about the 12-step program they, they have up here called Celebrate Recovery, and I began voicing my concerns over 12-step programs and Really not, but this is a little bit different. See, Jesus is a little bit different than all the other ways that everybody says it takes to do what a man is really created to do. So I found out that the higher power here at Believers Community Church on Friday nights at Celebrate Recovery is Jesus Christ. Now, I was all about some Jesus Christ. So as I was up here that Friday night, I had an opportunity to bump into a man named Blake Poston. Now, Blake was a, an instructor at the ministry while I was there. And I always admired his boldness and his, his, his ability to, to share the word with revelation and, and passion and desire and stuff. And he was kind of a mentor to me. Now, he was in a hurry. He was on his way to Little Rock because God was working his own plans out for Blake. But he wanted to stop by and see Jason. But on his way through the hallway right there, he says, man, I need to talk to you outside. So we go out to the parking lot. He says, I don't know why. I don't know why. I just feel led to pray with you today. And I, I, I just feel led to tell you this. You don't have to run back home to your four-year-old son to be a father. You can stay right here where God's called you. You can do the things that God's called you to do. And you'll be a better 
every other weekend father, and you'll ever be a father there by running and getting out of God's will. And he began praying over me in his parking lot with his hands on me, praying that I would surrender to God's plan. See, not many people knew this, but my desire was to get strong, financially stable, and to move back to Mountain Home because I wanted to, to bring honor to my family's name in a town for 30 years where I destroyed it and ruined it. But he got in his vehicle and he left, and I unpacked everything I had in my heart and in my mind right there in that parking lot. And I said, all right, God, this is it. This is my home. This is my hometown, and I'll do what you want me to do as long as you want me to do it here. And I've never looked back. See, I believe that God ordains the steps of his people. Hey, Jonathan, we put that verse up, that last one. I know I'm, hey, let's go ahead and put, the, put my picture up. The band's not coming out. I want to show you my, my pre-John 3 picture. Let's go ahead and put it up, everybody. Hey, hey, that's me before John 3, 16. A lot of, hey, listen, I know it looks like a caveman. Jason likes to remind me how, how terroristy I looking. <laughs> I look like a terrorist. But you know when my son seen it, who now lives with us, see, I'm not a weekend father. See, his mother lost her own battle. And after finding her deceased in the floor, he now lives with us full time. Because I held true to being where God called me to be and doing the things God called me to do. Put up my last verse as my friends come out here. Okay. <laughs> Missed one. Back up, 13. Those who are planted of the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Within my first two years of unpacking and settling here, I would be given opportunities to go and meet with boards of other churches, with deacons and leaders of other churches, one being in my hometown, which really pulled on my heartstrings, and I was given an opportunity that if I would like the position, I would go be able to go and assume pastor of that church. And we prayed about it. Gosh, everything I man, my hometown, about 50 people, not too much of a headache, not too little where it's weird when I preach and stuff. I'd been down there a couple times, and I'd preach. And then again, I would go and, and preach at a church in Ball Knob and be given that same opportunity. I'm not called to be the pastor of a church. I'm called to help great men doing great godly things. I'm called to make Jason Ramsey's life easier at J&J &J Construction, Celebrate Recovery, Believers Community Church. I'm called to do what David Ensel needs me to do here at this church, when he needs me to do it, even if it's replacing the toilet. Hey, it ain't all preaching. Okay, listen. This man's got some of the finest, hey, plumbing in his bathroom. But listen, Joe Ensel, Miranda Ensel, you teachers, the leaders, I'm here, I'm unpacked for you. See, a man flourishes when he knows his role. I don't have to be the one holding the umbrella. I just want to be under a good umbrella and a strong man holding it. And from time to time, I'd be willing to help him hold that umbrella. My life was a living hell getting to where I'm at today. So to say that God would have to go above and beyond to get me to move from where I'm at is an understatement. So I want to ask you today as we get ready to close out, because I know they have a song for you. And listen, I know it wasn't a preaching message, but I got a question for you. Are you rooted and planted? You've got to unpack. If this is your church, you've got to let some things go. If this is where you want to be established, if this is where you want to declare the Lord, then we've got to overlook some things. We're not perfect here. But the one we serve is perfect. And the word we preach is perfect. And Jesus Christ loves you. And he has a plan for you at this church. And he has a purpose for you. And it's not to sit here Sunday after Sunday and hearing us preach. Although that's a small part of it, it's so that you can be involved in it. Stop being so flighty. Stop always being ready to run off and unpack your bags today.